Hello, I'm Irene Tafrivain. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak here at your conference. I'm delighted. Not lovely to meet you all. Um, I'm um, a nurse by background. Um, I've worked many years in a hospice as a nurse, um, but I've also spent many years living and working with people with intellectual disabilities. And for the past 20 years, more than 20 years, I've done research around the end of life care needs of people with intellectual disabilities at Kingston University in London. I would have loved to be with you in person but I'm rather far away from you, um, so it just wasn't possible for me this time um, to fly all the way out to Australia, which is a real shame. I'd love to come to Australia because there are so many good things happening there, which I'll tell you about in a moment. But first of all, let me just introduce um, this talk for this morning. I'm going to talk about intellectual disability and palliative care. That's my topic. But I want to focus specifically on on your theme of inclusivity, equity and collaboration. Um, that is particularly challenging for this population, as you can imagine. So let's think about that. I'm going to tell you about my most recent projects, some of the research um, I've been doing and what I'm, I'm working on at the moment. But as I said, it's a real shame. I have never been to Australia and actually there are not many researchers in the world who are working on this topic. There are a couple of us in the UK, some in the Netherlands, but I always flag up Australia as the other place where really good projects and developments are going on. So this is one of them. This is Professor um, Julian Troller, Troller, who um, is working at the University of New South Wales, um, working on a project to develop um, a new model for palliative care provision for people with intellectual disabilities here in your country. There's also the outstanding work of Professor Roger Stancliffe in Sydney and Dr. Michelle Wieser. Um, they have developed um, resources and materials based on their research around um, how to talk to people with an intellectual disability about end of life care. But let's think first of all about what we mean by intellectual disability. And I'm just going to start with just reminding us that we're talking about people. This slide shows you the photographs of some of my friends, the people I've known, the people I've loved actually with, with intellectual disabilities. And all the people on this slide have died. Um, I've put in yellowed age they were when they died, so you begin, can already begin to see some of the challenges that people with an intellectual disability um, tend to die quite a lot younger than the general population, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. But you may well know about intellectual disability, but I find it always helpful to remind ourselves what we actually mean by that. So what is an intellectual disability and what does it mean for people to, to, to have an intellectual disability? We think, first of all, about impaired cognitive functioning. So we're talking about people who have an IQ below 70 not a particularly useful description that because we don't usually know people's IQ when we meet them, but that is the international um, definition. People will have some limitations in some of the social skills and, and, and in living skills, you know, limitations in skills of learning, adaptive behavior, things like um, being able to manage at school, to live independently, to access healthcare when you need it. You know, some people may be able to live quite independently, but others will need a lot of support. This is a condition that starts um, in childhood, so before the age of 18, and is lifelong. So we're not talking about people who have limitations in their cognitive skills due to dementia or brain tumors that happen later in life. These are people who have lived with their limitations and their skills all their lives, and so have their families living with supporting them. It's a large group of people, a very wide spectrum. It includes people with very mild intellectual disability. These are people who may well be able to live independent lives, um, get married, go to manage quite well at school, Sometimes things just fall apart a bit when, when there are big changes in their lives. So, for example, when they get ill or need to access health care, 
Um, most people with an intellectual disability fall within this end of the spectrum, having a mild intellectual disability, and they and you may not know about it. They may not realize that they have uh, that it's an intellectual disability that makes things difficult for them when when things change. On the other end of the spectrum, we have people with severe and profound intellectual disabilities. Those are the people that you will undoubtedly recognize and know about because they will not be able to manage without sometimes 24 hour support. Um, so there will be carers and families with people to help um, them communicate um, because people on the mild end of the learning disability spectrum will be able to talk with you, maybe explain to you sometimes in quite simple words what you know what what the problem is what their difficulties are um, but people on the who with profound and severe intellectual disabilities will need somebody to help interpret for you what they you know what they're thinking what's happening with them they are people who often don't communicate in words and don't understand spoken language how many people in the world have an intellectual disability it's quite a large minority group. We're talking approximately 2% of the world population. Now, definitions and estimates vary according to how people are counted and who is included in this definition. Um, it's quite a hidden population, particularly people with a mild intellectual disability are often missed. Um, but we're thinking about 2%, which is about 400,000 people, I'm told, in Australia. What that means is that one in 50 of your patients, if you have a patient population, will have an intellectual disability. If you think that you see fewer people with an intellectual disability than this, then that either means that access to your services is not equal or that you don't know that they've got an intellectual disability. And both these things, of course, matter. When we're talking about families affected by intellectual disability, of course, that is a lot bigger. Maybe several million families will have somebody amongst them um, with, with an intellectual disability. So it's definitely something you need to think about and you need to know about. Let me now tell you something about my current projects. When we're talking facts and figures, and particularly when we're thinking about people with intellectual disabilities who die, um, this is a really important program of work that is happening in England. Um, and this year is the first year that I've been involved in this in this program. This is where all deaths of people with an intellectual disability in England um, are invited to be reported to a national register. Um, and there are a number of questions on that register, data being collected about people with a learning disability, that's the terminology we use here in, in the UK. Um, and from next year, also, it will also include autistic people who don't have an intellectual disability. Um, data are collected and every year um, they are analysed. Um, and so we have a report coming out every year about what people die of, die of and how old they were when they died, for example. My involvement this year for the first time has been to work with a group of people with intellectual disabilities. There are seven people in that group, and along with ours, us who support them, who work on making that information accessible and easier to understand. And that is important when we talk about inclusion and equity. Here we are, as you can see, this was at Christmas. Um, we meet every month on Zoom. And we look at the data, at all the facts and figures coming in, and we've worked very hard this year um, on, on making that accessible. What people have told us very loudly and clearly is that what they want really is to have the information on a video rather than on many, many pages of however easy you think you make your easy read. Um, it can still be quite overwhelming. So let me just show you, share with you just a couple of clips from that video that we've just published um, a couple of weeks ago, um, where this group has worked really hard on making extremely complex and also quite difficult and painful information accessible to themselves and to people with an intellectual disability. 
this is the annual report for 2021 of the LEAD program. In this report, we're going to find out about the people with a learning disability who died in England in 2021. We heard about 3,304 people with a learning disability who died in 2021. Of each 10 people with a learning disability who died, six died before their 65th birthday. This row shows how many people were younger than 65 when they died. This row shows how many people were older than 65 when they died. Of each 10 people, who don't have a learning disability, only one died before their 65th birthday. Most people who don't have a learning disability were older than 65 when they died. It means that people who have a learning disability don't live as long as people who don't have a learning disability. People with a learning disability usually died 22 years earlier. As you can see, and as you can imagine, this was quite a difficult project for the group, um, but they really were keen to do this. And we just, we've just found how difficult it is, but also how important to really think about how you make your messages easier to understand. It isn't enough just to say something in simple and easy words, but to really think about you know, how you're going to communicate that message. And I don't know about you, but I find that once we've done that, once we've thought about, you know, how are you going to explain that people die 22 years earlier on average? What does that really mean? And how are you going to capture that in a picture? It was one of my colleagues with an intellectual disability, Richard, who said, well, people won't have quite as many birthdays then, will they? And it was his idea to show that in the disappearing with the disappearing birthday cakes. And this kind of report um, has come out year after year. It's been running about five or six years now. It's quite depressing that these numbers, you know, the difference in age and death stay so high. Um, but for me, I find that, and I've heard it from others as well, that it's only now looking at that really quite painful slide of the disappearing birthday cake that it hits me really what that means and that we really need to keep an eye on that and do something about it if you are interested in finding out more or watching the entire video it's about 12 minutes long um, or reading the full report then you can go to this website from our lead partners for this project is king's college london um, I'm just leaving that up here for you to take note and um, and go to have a look at it if you like. But let's move on now to thinking about end of life and palliative care. A lot of the deaths that we've seen and, and heard about within this this annual report are avoidable. We found that about half of the population of people with learning intellectual disabilities in England died an avoidable death. That compares to about a quarter of people in the general population. That's shocking enough, but of course there are in many times when death is going to happen, we know that it's coming, what people need is palliative care. So what are the challenges for you as palliative care professionals and how can you really include and involve people with an intellectual disability in the decisions that affect them? It's always helpful to think about that first from the perspective of the person. So what do you think is going to be difficult for the person with an intellectual disability who's coming to the end of their lives and who will need palliative care? If you take a moment to think about that, um, I wonder whether some of the things you've thought of are the same as the first thing that I've put on my list. I mean, there's many more, but here are some examples. People will find it difficult to explain to you or to even know for themselves how how to explain what they're feeling or thinking, which is always a very helpful thing to know if you are a palliative care professional. They may really struggle to understand what's happening, the changes in their lives. Has anybody actually explained what's going on? 
Um, some people, more than others, particularly people on the um, who are autistic, find it quite difficult to cope with change. So we'll need a lot of support there. And of course, when you need palliative care, when, when you're ill, then a lot of the things in your world will be changing. Understanding spoken or written instructions understand why you you know what what you're doing and why you're doing them and therefore sticking to treatments understanding consent procedures it depends a little bit of course also on the um on people's abilities and limitations um but particularly be mindful also of people who have a mild intellectual disability and who as I said earlier, you may not realize that that's, that's the reason why they haven't turned up for appointments. It might not be unwillingness. It might simply be that they don't do diaries very easily or they don't understand that taking morphine twice a day means once with your breakfast and once when you brush your teeth and go to bed. So there are a lot of, then there's a whole wide range of issues there. How about you, though? you may find it difficult to to make a diagnosis to actually figure out what it is that's going on and also to know and to see when the palliative phase starts when do you initiate palliative care that is often quite late for this population that that people realize that this is what is needed Assessing pain and other symptoms, that is really a concern I hear most probably from palliative care professionals. How on earth am I going to figure out what, you know, what is happening and what we can do about it? As I say, for you to understand what this person is feeling or thinking, how can I explain things? How can you communicate? How, how on earth can you involve this person? But also knowing who to involve. And Quite rightly, within the world of palliative care, there is a huge emphasis now on involvement, on doing things together, on making sure that the care you give and the decisions you make are care and decisions that the person will, would have chosen and will want for themselves, that fits with their life, with, the, with the, the person who they are. How are you going to do that for people with whom you may find it difficult to communicate? So we're talking about end of life care planning and advanced care planning. And that is the focus really of my current project that just started a couple of months ago. Of course, you wanted to be as few surprises as possible so that everyone is prepared for what might happen and that the care is based on the person's values and wishes and preferences. You may be very familiar, probably will be very familiar with what end of life care planning is and what it means um, and also, really, you will know probably more than the person and their carers, their staff, what to expect, what the future might look like in terms of medical progression, really. Um, so think helping teams, helping families to understand what might possibly happen. The surprise question is really useful for this population. Would you be surprised if this person died within the next year? Um, and if the answer there is no, then really help them to start thinking about this. People with an intellectual disability may not die of something that is nice. Well, I say nice is not nice, but predictable, like, like the cancer journey, for example. People often live with frailty, with multiple medical and health conditions that make things very complex. People may have epilepsy and diabetes and heart problems all at once. Um, so it is often a surprise. It is often a surprise for for the carers, for the staff, for the families that something is changing or that people are dying or have died. But then when you ask them looking back, they said, actually, we wouldn't we shouldn't have been so surprised. So helping people to to think ahead, but also involving the person in that. That is the focus of my current work. There are a lot of easy read plans, um, you know, advanced care plans out there. I find that a lot of them are not actually advanced end of life care plans. They are after life care plans. And there's a lot about funeral planning. Nothing wrong with that, of course, but we all know that there is more to end of life care planning than planning a funeral. 
And for people with an intellectual disability, these questions actually also for me, these questions might not be so easy and straightforward to answer, however easy you think your easy read leaflet is, where you'd like to be cared for. It's quite difficult to know if you don't know what's going to be wrong with you or what your options are. So much more useful might be questions like really helping people to know helping you to know how this person wants to live, what matters to them, what is most important, and how you can make that possible. If it isn't possible for this person to stay at home, what is so important to them about home? And is it possible to transfer that to somewhere else, for example, whether that's having their pets with them or their family around or their favorite music or a quiet place, whatever it is. But these are the kind of questions that we need to help people to think about. And how we help people with an intellectual disability to be involved in their end-of-life care planning, of course, so much depends on who that person is and, you know, what their communication and involvement in abilities are. So I'm going to show you the trailer, the introduction to the Victoria and Stewart project, which is the study that we've just started around involving people um, in end-of-life care planning. The easiest is just to show you this. It's based on the lives of two people um, who have died and who had very diverse needs. The Victoria and Stewart Project, end of life care planning with people with learning disabilities. How can we support people to make their own choices at the end of life? A study inspired by people like Stewart and Victoria. Six different professionals were involved from 15 disciplines. Together we made it easy. The lead physician for learning disabilities was instrumental in Stuart being discharged. She understood he hated being in hospital and involved the right people to get him home. We had a multi-professional group email and WhatsApp group for 24-hour support. His visits from professionals were spaced out so that he didn't feel overwhelmed. He decided who should visit and when. Whenever the nurses visited Stuart, they always made sure we were okay. They even called on their day off sometimes. Stuart's carers were trained in person-centred care, so they knew each other well and helped him update his own PCP. Even in the pandemic, Stuart was able to spend time with his family every day, either through COVID secure visits or online. Stuart has been planning his end of life care for two years. He even told us the horses had to be white, not black. We made sure every details of his plan was followed. Stuart had a very challenging behaviour and because of how and what the Eden Vale did for him, we were able to spend the last precious weeks of his life as a family. These times we would never have had without them. He himself told me that he was so happy they were there for him. To see him comfortable, relaxed and happy with them meant everything. They were even there for us. Thank you. You're very, very relaxed. Oh, you know, he will help me. Victoria and Lisa were both young women in their early 20s. Um, we both had profound learning disabilities and, and a variety of uh, physical disabilities, including very complex health needs. 
and they lived together in a purpose-built bungalow. Um, they had their own team of workers and they lived safely and happily together for many, many years. We knew that Victoria was going to die because her consultant, her renal consultant, told us her kidneys were failing and uh, dialysis and transplant was not an option. Throughout her life, although she was a woman without words, she knew what she wanted from life. Mm. It was up to us to uh, interpret and then give her what she wanted. We decided, her family and her circle of friends decided that she would die over a period of time. That was a huge decision mm. for us to make. I, I think we were recognising that slowly, slowly her life was being more restricted. So Victoria loved to be out and about in her wheelchair outside, but then she got too frail to put her in her wheelchair. So most of her life shrunk. It shrunk from, the, from outside to inside, to the living room and then to her bedroom over a period of time. So you, we had to be inventive and think about, well, the, the world's got to come to her. You know, we sat and we talked a lot as to the staff team, and the, particularly the team leader. Mm. I focused on the team leader because she would influence the rest of her team. And we're talking about a team of 15 people. Quite a lot of people. Mm. And then there was all the other fringe people like the GP and the palliative nurse and various other, and, and district nurses coming in. So they all had to be made aware of what our plans were and to actually sign up and sort of promise to follow the plan. I think if there's family and they're, they're, they're uh, aware of all this like we were, they should be guided by the family, but they should join together to actually make it happen. Uh, well, a, a, an acute care plan will enable that to happen because you, you go through all the stages. And that was the beauty of having that very detailed end of um, acute care plan because we'd gone through it, we talked about it as a staff group. We talked about, you know, she will not go to hospital and what you would do to prevent her going to hospital. Victoria died at home with her family by her side. Mm. With fairy lights, with people who love me mm. and to beautiful music. Mm. So I always think, as well as she could, Victoria lived happily. But she actually died majestically, if that's... I've been struggling for a word, and it is majestically. Mm. And wouldn't you want to wish that mm. for your nearest and dearest? And, um, you know, that was... And, and I think if you have a good death, if you have a good death, the pain of it for the ones that you leave really helps. I mean, we had to work hard for it and I want it for other people. How can we make end of life care planning work for other people with learning disabilities? We will work together with people with learning disabilities, families, services and academics. This two-year study starts in April 2022. So, as you can see, the needs and the abilities and the wishes of Stuart and Victoria were very, very different. Stuart was well able to engage with the kind of easy read, end of life care planning, you know, tools that are available. He actually attended um, a couple of end of life care planning workshops that um, his local team was running for people with an intellectual disability. Once he knew he was dying, he wanted to do those workshops. Um, Victoria, as you could see on the other hand, really needed her circle of support, her family, her friends, her care staff to, to speak for her and to interpret and tell other professionals um, what it is that she 
wants. And that's possible. So we're currently looking at how to do that for everybody. If you are interested in this, then um, do go to our YouTube channel where this the full video that I've just shown you is, but there's also a, a half hour version of Victoria's story. We're working on a longer version of Stuart's story as well, and a couple of other um, short videos about this project and about involving people. The key aspect of this study is that we really are doing this together. So we've employed three people with an intellectual disability. There's Amanda sitting here on the left and Leon on the right um, and Richard in the blue shirt um, who are helping us to run focus groups with people with intellectual disabilities. We are currently, as you see around this table, testing out various data collection methods, making things as easy as possible. Um, even for people who have no words to communicate to us what they think about end-of-life care planning. And they will then also help to interpret the data and to look at all the materials that are out there. That can include materials that um, have come out of Australia, because as I said earlier, you're doing great things here in, this in your country. Um, and we'll test them out and see really what works best for the people in England. My wonderful colleagues, this is the culmination really of, of, well, two decades of working with people with intellectual disabilities. Amanda in the middle has been my co-researcher for quite a long time now, more than a decade. Um, Richard in the blue shirt is quite new to the job. Um, and Leon in the black outfit is even newer. And it's always amazes me. It shouldn't really now, but it still amazes me how keen people are to be involved in this kind of work, how keen the people out there in, in focus groups are to talk about death and dying. But how we do that, you know, in a way that is, just, I mean, fun is the wrong word to do. It's never fun really to talk about death. Um, but we do laugh a lot. And if you work in a hospice or in a palliative care team, you know that, don't you? That it, you know, it, it, life is not all doom and gloom. So it is possible. Keep an eye out, um, Victoria and Stuart Project um, on our website, our Twitter account. I will leave you with just a number of um, resources that may be helpful to, for you, websites and such like. I don't know how I do my work without books beyond words. They are picture books developed specifically with and for people with an intellectual disability to help them think about and talk about things that will affect them in their lives. Um, so all the pictures that I've shown you come from those books. I've co-written um, one or two of the titles around end-of-life care. So really worth looking at their website. The PCPLD network, Palliative Care for People with a Learning Disability, um, has um, a number of resources that you can go to and, and, and use for end-of-life care and palliative care, talking about dying. As you can see, Victoria and her mother, Jean, are our poster girls for this website. Um, Jean is a member of our uh, specialist advisory group. And finally, this is my own website, which I will try and keep as up to date as possible um, with the latest things that we're doing, developing. So it's, it's worth just having a look at that and see um, if there's anything else that you might be interested in and following up. So thank you very much for your interest and attention on this Saturday morning. And I do hope that technology is going to work and I'll be able to answer some of your questions now. I'm sitting to attention, hopefully, um, here in Europe um, to join you live. Thank you.